Good afternoon. It's time to begin our Sunday night worship service at the Carsey Church of Christ. In a moment, I'll be reading from 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody here tonight, especially any visitors we might have with us. And we want you to know that we count you as our honored guest and invite you back to worship with us anytime you're in our area. And now for our Bible reading from 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirits and belief of the truth. For unto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the tra traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. Now we'll be led in our song service by Brother Jeremy. All the songs this evening will be on the screen, but if you prefer to use a book, the first song will be number two, uh, I'm sorry, 682. 682. To God be the glory. Song be number 244. 244. Sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Time is filled with
Let's pray. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come together as a body of thy people this time, at this time and worship thee, the only true living God. That we can sing praises to thee, that we can hear thy word proclaimed. We ask thy blessings from Brother Josh to give him a good remembrance of the things he's chosen to speak on. And may we, with attentive ears, listen to what he says. And if there, and what Whatever we can use to help benefit our lives, to better serve thee, let us take it in and use it and put it to use. Father, we ask our blessings upon the Anderson family and the Dixon, for Sister Dixon who has passed on to her glory in heaven. May we ascribe to live in such a way that we can join her one day in heaven. Father, we pray that thou would comfort them with thy words and that we could comfort them help comfort them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we thank thee for this nation in which we live and for the blessings that we have been enjoying for many years. May we continue to have this right to worship thee without fear from outside souls and that may our children and our grandchildren be able to enjoy that blessing. Father, we pray our blessings upon all our missionaries wherever they may be, in countries that are very poor and, and people are eager to listen to the truth, may we have the funds to put them there to get them to hear the truth and obey it while there, while there is time on earth is still here. Father, we pray thou bless upon those who are sick, those who are at home and cannot make it to the services. We pray that whatever means is being used to treat them, that it will work and that they will be healthy again soon and able to get out about and to come back and worship with us. Father, we pray thy blessings upon all our young people. I would bless them. Bless them as they try to serve thee. Bless us as older people that we may set the proper example cause them to want to serve thee. Father, as we continue to worship thee this night, forgive us of things that we have done wrong. May we repent of them and not stand pure in thy sight again. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
using your books, we'd like to mark the song invitation will be number, if I read my handwriting, 337. Number 337 will be the song encouragement after the lesson. And before the lesson, we'll sing number 622. We'll sing the first and third verses of 622. Let's stand as we sing the song. <coughs> Tell me the story of Jesus, right in my heart everywhere. Tell me the story of God's precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Good evening. It's good to have you all with us uh, for a Sunday evening worship service. And either lucky for you or unlucky for you, I'm the speaker tonight. Um, I know we've got visitors because there's a large chunk. They're actually my family. And I am very appreciative that they've come out to support me this evening. And if you're not a regular member and if you're not a member of my family and you are visiting today, uh, we are glad to have you. Uh, and I should add that I'm not the normal speaker. Uh, as of Brother Edward and Miss Barbara's family, I see them busy with us. I think they know that. But um, based on the circumstances, I do wish that it was it was better. Um, we, we have lost Miss Dixon, and I know her service was today. So we need to continue to keep Brother Edward and, and uh, Miss Barbara, Amanda Lee from their families, keep them in our prayers. But I did have a lesson prepared, so I am ready to speak. But depending on... I don't know if you, if, if those of you were here the last time that I spoke a couple of months ago on the fifth Sunday, I think I had about 40, 11 slides on there. I had an hour-long lesson that was fit into about 45 minutes, which was still too long. I was told that I leaned up on the, on the pulpit here a little bit much, so I tried to correct those, and I hope that I don't pick up anything new tonight, but uh, I'm going to give this a shot real quick. But, and one other thing before I do get started, um, real quick, as I was preparing for this yesterday afternoon, I had my lesson written out, and I was taking that opportunity to see if I needed to add anything, if I needed to take anything away. So I kind of just sat down on the couch. I was basically, I set my uh, timer on my phone to kind of time it, see where I was, and I just started talking. I even came up with a little fake introduction just to time it all out to see how it went. And about two or three minutes into it, I realized that Haven, my daughter, was laying on the couch and she was kind of looking at me 
just a little bit weird. So it made me stop. I stopped the timer on my phone, and I said, hey, but I guess I should have let you know that I'm going to be practicing my sermon. I'm speaking tomorrow night, and I'm talking here to myself, and I guess that's kind of weird. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to keep going. And being a five-year-old, I don't know, she just she kind of leaned back on the couch with her head propped up, and she said, it's okay. I'm practicing, too. I'm throwing these goldfish crackers and trying to catch them in my mouth. <laughs> That was not the response I was expecting, but it was sweet nevertheless. She didn't make me feel embarrassed by that. So, um, but I do have a lesson prepared for tonight. Now, I didn't put uh, any slides this time. I'm just going to try to speak and hopefully not be distracted and see if this might work a little bit better for me. But my lesson tonight is entitled Kicking Against the Goads. Um, And it's about the Apostle Paul, and probably more importantly, before he became who we know as the Apostle Paul, it's about Saul of Tarsus. And I personally enjoy and and always have enjoyed studying about the Apostle Paul and and specifically his conversion on the road to Damascus. I can think back and remember uh, as a child being in Wednesday night Bible study lessons and and hearing that lesson and just kind of of being really uh, just interested in the story of how Saul became the the Apostle Paul as we know him. And the familiar passage um, that I'm sure we all know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Just some very powerful words that Jesus spoke to Saul uh, on that road to Damascus. But the statement that follows that, that's in that same verse, it is apparently something that just never really resonated with me. Um, after, after the Lord kind of speaks to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He also adds, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. And it wasn't until, I, I don't know, five or six months back that I, I heard a lesson with the same title, Kicking Against the Goads, that it kind of opened my mind all of a sudden to something that I had been reading over tens, probably hundreds of times, all the different times that I've either studied or heard a sermon on this. But I completely just overlooked that passage altogether and never really thought about what that meant. Um, And this was inspired by a lesson uh, by a speaker named Wes McAdams. He's from the Baker Heights Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas. Um, Beck actually come across these series of lessons about Saul of Tarsus online, and it was from that speaker, and he had a series probably over the course of Sunday night lessons, probably 20 different lessons, and I kind of listened to a couple of these, and that particular lesson really just opened opened my mind for some reason, and so I know that it's not very creative to entitle this lesson the same thing that he did, but to me, I had read that phrase, uh, I don't know how many times, and it never really stuck out to me, so I thought, what better way to uh, continue it, to someone else who may have been in the same place I was, I'm going to name this lesson the same thing and try to make that phrase stand out to somebody that reads it from this point on. And my intent was not to replicate that lesson. You can check it out as well as all the other sermons uh, by Brother McAdams. It's on the, the Baker Heights website. I think it's bakerheights.org, uh, the whole series of lessons. He, he's a great, very emotional speaker. But I didn't want to replicate that lesson. I kind of wanted to take the section of that that kind of just uh, blew me away and do my own study and take my own stab at it. So that's what it's going to be tonight. Um, and if you will, go ahead and, and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26. That's where, that's where I'm going to take the passage from that's going to base around my lesson tonight. Um, there are three different accounts of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts, which obviously points out how important of a moment that it is. Um, Luke does his recording of it in, in chapter 9, uh, then in chapter 22, in chapter 26, you hear Paul's own personal account of what happened, and we're going to be using chapter 26 uh, to set the tone for what's going on in Acts chapter 26. Um, a few lessons earlier, I want to thank uh, Acts chapter 21, I think that Paul was apprehended by the Jews in Jerusalem at this time. Um, he was being accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. Which, as, as the Bible tells us, that wasn't necessarily the case. But Paul also had uh, a reputation at that time. He's been seen in and out of the city of Jerusalem uh, with Gentiles in tow with him. And whether or not the Jews really thought that he brought them in there or not, it's possible that they may have just wanted to pin that on him so that they could kind of hold him accountable for something. But anyway, in, chap- in chapter 26 that we're getting this scripture from tonight, uh, Paul is giving his account to King Agrippa and Festus. And if we'll look to it, uh, I told you to turn in. I didn't turn myself. But Acts chapter 26, we're going to go to verse 14. And it says, And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to get kick against the goats. 
Now, if you want to mark that, I'm going to stop right there as far as Acts chapter 26 and, and any more discussion on the on the uh, conversion of Saul right there. But I want to kind of go back a little bit, and I want to talk about Saul of Tarsus and his early life because we, I feel like we need to do a case study to find out why, why Saul was where he was at that point in time. Um, and when we think about the Apostle Paul, um, we think of him as a tireless uh, disciple of Christ, or at least that's how I think of him. He penned many epistles that make up a, a good portion of the New Testament that we read, 13 in total. Uh, they were written as letters to the different churches, uh, churches in Rome, churches uh, in Corinth and Gal in Galatia, and even some individuals such as Timothy and Titus. Um, but um, he, 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 he wrote a lot of important uh, epistles that we use in just about any sermon that you may ever heard preach. You may hear a quote from one of these books that Paul wrote. Um, and I've always, as I mentioned earlier, I've always been fascinated in studying about Paul. And I think part of the reason that is is because you take Saul of Tarsus, who was a zealous persecutor of Christians, who did a complete 180 and dedicated the remainder of his life for Jesus. And he did that by spreading the gospel. Yeah, Jesus sent him to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, and he did that to the point that he was persecuted himself. Uh, he suffered imprisonment on more than one occasion. And we, he was eventually executed for his belief in his work for the Lord. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us how Paul died, but we do know from Second um, Timothy uh, chapter 4, his sorrowful writing to Timothy, and, and he feels like he's being poured out as a drink offering, and that uh, he feels like he's fought the good fight and, and the race is finished. But uh, we kind of know or we're kind of led to believe that Paul in prison was expecting the end to come near but before he was the Apostle Paul, as we know him and all the great things that he did, let's go back to, the, to Saul, who he was before, who was Saul of Tarsus. Um, I think a good description of him uh, could be an obsessive young man, unshakable in his conviction. I kind of read that uh, in one of the commentaries that I was using for this study, and I think that it's probably the best way that you could uh, define him and his characteristics. He had a very strong zeal for serving God. It was just misguided. And, and Brother Edward actually mentioned, mentioned last week in, uh, in his sermon, I think it was Sunday night, and said that zeal without knowledge can be dangerous. And I think when we talk about Saul of Tarsus, I think that's probably a very good example of what you've got there. Because uh, before his conversion, Saul did not know Jesus. And you couple that with his strong ties to his Jewish religion, uh, the traditions and beliefs that he held, I think that caused him to be a chief persecutor of Christians. Um, later in life, Paul admits this about himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he quotes to Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So Paul kind of recognized himself as the sinner. Of all the work that he'd done after that time, he still looked back, I think, and, and probably thought of himself and the things that he had done. In Galatians 1, chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, he kind of talks about his almost obsessive uh, zeal. And we'll kind of go back to that scripture in just a little bit. But Paul, after the fact, was kind of very aware of, of how he was at a younger age. But when we talk about this zeal, this, this passion that he had, I, I kind of want to talk about, figure out where that came from. So Saul of Tarsus, as we know, was born in the city of Tarsus. Tarsus was the chief city um, in Cilicia, which is now modern-day Turkey. If we were looking on a map and you see the Mediterranean Sea, it's probably to the northeast, northeast region. But it's about 450 miles away from Jerusalem, so it's a, it's a pretty good trek. Um, Philippians 3, verse 5 tells us that Paul was, Saul of Tarsus was from the, pri, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, and he was named after the most renowned representative of that tribe, King Saul, whom we read about in the Old Testament. Uh, and it's important to note that the, the name Saul means called of God. So even at his birth, Saul had, was, had a rich tradition in his Jewish religion. Um, we could maybe almost deduce that Saul's family could have been wealthy. We don't know this. The Bible doesn't tell us this. But we do know, according to Paul, in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, he was sent at a young age to Jerusalem to study the Jewish law and to study Scripture. Um, I mentioned Philippians 3, verse 5 a while ago, but it also tells us that he was a Pharisee. And this fact alone could probably tell us uh, or could explain the most about why Saul may have had the zeal that he did. Pharisees, we know, were known to be the strictest sect of Jews. Uh, Paul admits this in Acts 26, verse 5. Pharisees were thought of this way because they had a strict observance to the Mosaic law. They were very particular. They were, they were steeped in the Jewish law. They knew it frontwards to backwards probably. Uh, but they were very critical of the exactness of the laws that were, that were written out. Some of these examples could be 
strict giving of tithes to the percentage. I mean, it's, it's kind of known that the Pharisees were very particular about this. There's multiple passages that talk about circumcision uh, of the Jewish people and even observing the Sabbath, um, what you were not supposed to be able to do on the Sabbath, you know, no working, but even if you were making a journey, there was even so far that they kind of knew in terms of distance. They were very meticulous with their recognition of all the minute details of the Jewish law. Um, and Jesus actually referred to these things, that they, these details of the law. Jesus referred to them as the tradition of elders or the tradition of men. And he mentioned these. Um, Matthew chapter uh, 15, verse 3, it actually mentions about the Pharisees and the scribes approaching Jesus. And he's asking, asking them, um, I'm going to paraphrase, but they're basically saying that the apostles, your followers, are transgressing the law of Moses. They're not washing, they're not cleansing their hands before they eat. And Jesus responded to this and he kind of rebuked the Pharisees for this pointing out because it seemed to be that they were more, more concerned about the small minutia, the small minor details of the law and missed the bigger picture and things altogether. And it's only natural that the way that Jesus responded to the Pharisees and, and how deeply ingrained the Pharisees were to the traditions of their ancestors that there definitely was not uh, a mutual respect for each other. And so that kind of, to me, explains some of the feelings and some of the zeal, the zeal that, that Saul may have had as a young man. But going back to his teaching in Jerusalem, uh, he tells us in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, that he was a student of Gamaliel. And in Acts chapter 22, I'm going to kind of go through this scripture. It tells us a little bit. But this was shortly after he was apprehended in Jerusalem by the Jews there. Um, and, and they were very upset that, that he was walking around with Gentiles and that he was preaching the name of Jesus. And... Um, they, they were so upset that they felt like maybe they wanted to put him to death over this. But Paul, being a Pharisee just like they were, tried to talk on their level, and he says this to them in Acts 22, verse 3. Um, he was brought up in the city, at, or, I was brought up in this city, which is Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness, strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. But if you're looking in your Bibles, if you turn to Acts chapter 22, verse 3, it's kind of important to point out when he says our father's law. If you'll notice, fathers is not capitalized. Uh, there's no apostrophe S. It's basically, um, it's plural. And, and I think what he's trying to say there, he's not trying to say God, our father's law. He's basically saying our, as Pharisees, our fathers. So I think that this kind of gives you another example of how the Pharisees felt. I mean, I believe that they were doing what they were doing because they had a strong belief in God. But it almost appeared like the traditions of their ancestors was just as equally as important. And so um, that's, that's kind of something that Saul had, uh, Paul had mentioned to them at that time. But as Saul grew into a young man, he grew in his knowledge of the scriptures, but he also grew in his zeal as well. And apparently this caused him to be able to move up in rank against some of the peers, um, uh, some of the contemporaries that he has. It, uh, Paul tells us in Galatians 1, chapter, uh, verse 14, that Saul advanced in Judaism well, belong, well beyond many of his contemporaries of his own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. And even here in this scripture, he, he makes reference to the traditions of their fathers, which mer uh, many Pharisees held at that time. We're not introduced to Saul until Acts chapter 7. And if you may remember, chapter 7 is when Stephen is basically kind of giving his defense to the Jews he was also preaching the name of Jesus, and he was approached by the Jews about this. And Stephen was, he was pretty strong and harsh in some of his language to the Jews, but he brought up some good points. But in doing so, he was actually stoned to death and became the first martyr for Jesus. But we're introduced to, to Saul in this, in this particular uh, set of passages in verse 58, I think it was. It mentions that Saul was the one who held the coats for the men that went up to stone Stephen. Um, even... Paul recollects in prayer in Acts chapter 22, verse 20, he says, When the blood of your martyr Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. And if we go into the next chapter, Acts chapter 8, the very first verse, it says explicitly that Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. This is the first example that we have of Saul's execution. But verse 1 also says uh, that on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Verse 3 tells us that Saul made havoc of the church. And he was entering into house after house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. That's a pretty powerful thought if we think about that for a minute. In our worship services, uh, in sermons we hear, 
oftentimes in prayer, I know I've included this in prayer, we sometimes will say that we are thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather in this place uh, to worship the Lord without fear of death and persecution. I mean, we say that a lot, and we mean that when we say that. But in this time, um, the, the early Christians in the first century, they were persecuted and probably had a day-to-day -day fear of that. And not only was Saul going to a worship service to get them, he was actually going into their homes. And as you can imagine, they may have had families. Uh, he doesn't spare women. Uh, men and women were both pulled out of their homes uh, and arrested and, and put into prison simply for believing that Jesus and, and, and worshiping in Jesus and saying that he was the Son of God. Now, that may sound bad, but that's, that's not all that he did. Paul admits to us how brutal he was to the cause of persecution of Christians. In Acts chapter 22, verse 4, he says that he persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering prison, uh, into prison both men and women. Acts chapter 22, verse 19, he says, In every synagogue he beat and imprisoned those who believed in Jesus. And in Acts 26, verse 10, he says, Having received authority from chief priests, when they were put to death, he cast his vote against them and also compelled them to blaspheme. Um, when we talk about Saul and we say that he persecuted Christians, sometimes we can oversimplify that and not necessarily bring out what he truly did. But as Paul admitted in his later life, that he, he really paints the pictures uh, to the extent of how much he hated Christians and their belief in Jesus. So passionately, so much so, that he would cast his vote to put them to death. I mean, if, if, it was, if it was come about that, you know, maybe the Jewish council said, what should we do with these people? Essentially, Paul was, or Saul was saying, put them to death. Uh, and even to try to coerce them to blaspheme the name of Christ, he tried to get them to deny their belief in Jesus. He was very zealous and very serious about his goals here. So now we're a step closer, I think, to understanding Saul's powerful zeal and the explanation of why he was doing these, these horrible things that he was doing. But let's go back to the journey on the road to Damascus. After this period of persecution of Christians in Jerusalem, Saul went to the high priest and basically asked for written permission to go into the synagogue. Well, the permission was to take to the synagogues of Damascus and to basically go there to find any man or woman who was professing that Jesus was the Son of God and worshiping him as Christians. He wanted to be able to take them back bring them back to Jerusalem for trial, whether to put them into prison or put them to death or, or whatever the case may be there. But after this, this round of persecution in Jerusalem, uh, many of the Christians fled. And Paul was, Saul was made aware that there was a large number of Christians that were in Damascus, which was about 140 miles away. And I think at this time it could be deduced that Saul's zeal and determination may have been at an all-time high. Not only did he go to the chief priest and ask for permission to go to a land hundreds of miles, over a hundred miles away just to get believers in Christ. But he also apparently went through this trip nonstop. And the reason I say that, if you're still in Acts chapter 26, let me find the verse. And he's talking to King Agrippa. I should have written down the, the exact verse, but he basically describes to King Agrippa that he describes seeing a light from heaven at midday. Now, I point this out because in this part of the world, especially at this point in time, I think that it's very reasonable to assume that one might, you know, maybe stop their journey in the middle of the day. It makes a lot of sense to me that uh, even right now, it's summer here, but if we were traveling on foot from here to Knoxville, um, it might make a lot of sense to travel early in the morning before, it's get real, before it gets real hot, maybe take a break drink water, eat food in the middle of the day, and then continue the, the journey later on. But apparently, uh, Saul was approached by Jesus, and Saul and his travelers were approached by Jesus in the middle of the day. So this tells me that maybe Saul didn't even want to stop. If it took five or six days to get to Damascus, he wanted to see if he could get there in four days. Um, and then we come to that moment when Jesus approaches Saul and his fellow travelers. And in Acts chapter 26, four, verse 14, we read that familiar declaration from Jesus that says, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And that line that read right after that, apparently I've never put that much thought into, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, through much research, I have found out that a goad was an implement used in farming. Uh, it was a long rod. If you can imagine, probably, if I'm almost six foot tall, it was on average between six and eight foot uh, long with a spear on the end. And it was usually used by a farmer uh, that may have a plow that was being pulled by oxen. 
In some case, the farmer may have even had a one-handed plow. With the other side of it, he, he may have used his one hand to kind of keep it steered as straight as he could, and then the other side was open where he could take that goad and point it towards the lower part of that ox's leg so that he could um, prod the oxen maybe to go straight or turn a certain way to go faster, but more importantly, that goad was used to control that ox. Um, if the ox attempted to kick back, he's obviously going to kick back into that goal that had the spear on the end, and it's going to hurt him. It's going to cause the ox much pain. So thus, we have the phrase, kicking against the goats. It makes total sense to me after I learned what that was. But we can look at this phrase, kicking against the goats, as an act of submission. The goat is used to get the ox to submit to the plowman's direction. Jesus probably used this expression. I imagine at this time that that was a metaphor that was widely understood by just about anybody in that part of the world at that time. Um, note that the phrase that Jesus used um, when he approached Saul, he said his name twice. In various scriptures and different accounts in the Bible we hear of, and oftentimes it may be God calling upon an individual in the Bible, but they may say their name twice. Jesus approached Saul here and said, Saul, Saul, which I, I think that generally means that First of all, they're making sure that they're approaching this one person, they're addressing this one person, and that there's obviously going to be something pretty important after this. So after Jesus called upon Saul and said his name twice, he also asked the question. Jesus was pretty direct. He, he just automatically told Saul that he was persecuting him and asked why. He didn't first approach Saul and say, Saul, you're persecuting me. Why are you doing this? The scripture says that he basically just went ahead and asked, why are you persecuting me? And uh, I think this is an pretty important uh, point to pick out because it made me think of Matthew 25. Uh, you may be familiar with this passage of Scripture when Jesus said, Inasmuch as you did not do it into one of the least of the, these, you did not do it unto me. Jesus was essentially talking about after the day of judgment, if, if he separated to give a metaphor of the sheep on the right and the goats on the left, but if he looked to, the, to those on the left of him and basically said that I was hungry and you did not feed me, I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink, I was um, naked and you did not clothe me, um, I was sick and in prison and you did not come to see me, he basically said that even when they asked him, Lord, Lord, when did we see you this way, he essentially said, if you've seen any in this way, you were basically doing that to me. And I think he's here telling Saul this, that you may not have persecuted me directly, but you persecuted my believers and those that confess me as the Son of God. You're persecuting me. Uh, and then Jesus added, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I think that maybe he was meant to tell Saul that he was fighting against submission. Saul was serving God with much zeal, but he was adamantly denying that Jesus was the Son of God and persecuting those that believed that he was. Saul was stubbornly um, ignoring the scriptures that I imagine that if he, if he took time as a young man to study the scriptures, he might have been well aware that there were various references in the Old Testament to a coming Messiah, prophecies that, that were going to be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So we can only wonder if Saul ever, during his persecution, we can only wonder if he had any doubts or second guesses at all about what he was doing. But I'm going to go back to his teacher, Gamaliel, that I mentioned earlier. Um, Paul tells us in Acts chapter 22 that he was taught by Gamaliel. And we know a little bit about Gamaliel, especially in the book of Acts. In chapter 5, if you remember that the, uh, the Jews had apprehended the apostles at that time, again for preaching the name of Jesus, um, and they were upset to the point that they wanted to, that they were furious and plotted to kill, kill the apostles. They'd already given warning once before when they had apprehended, uh, I'm, 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 my brain has lapsed on it, but they'd already been, uh, arrested once for this. So they were pretty serious this time and kind of wanted to take action against what they were doing. But Gamaliel speaks up, and he basically tells them that we should not uh, respond in violence to these men. He essentially said to the other Jews that they have dealt others before that believed against what the Jews believed, and he said that if this was the work of God, then we don't need to be, we don't need to be persecuting these men ourselves. But I say that because if that's the way, that was, Gamaliel was a very well-respected man, man in the Jewish council. And if this was his attitude to, to not resort to violence just because these men were preaching about Jesus, we could probably assume it was hard to believe that he would teach Saul in this way. But Saul's powerful zeal must have just caused him to kind of go overboard with it and want to, uh, want to imprison people and put them to death for believing in Jesus. So we can't know for sure. Uh, but in that moment of being approached by Jesus on the road to Damascus, um, maybe Saul became aware that he had been kicked against the goads, serving God, but entirely the wrong way. 
So that's a long telling of how the greatest persecutor of Christians became one of the greatest apostles. Again, just something that has always been amazing to me and given, given me a great respect for the Apostle Paul. But what about us as Christians? Do we kick against the goats? Do we find ourselves being steered by God to do His will only for us to kick back and do the things that we want to do as opposed to the thing that God wants us to do? Um, we have to be careful because continuously kicking against the goats can obviously cause us great harm. Um, think back to that ox who's kicking against the goat. If that ox continues just to keep on kicking against the goat, he's only just continually hurting himself possibly to the point of, of crippling itself. And we could be doing that spiritually to ourselves as Christians if we continue to kick against the goads. We could make a parallel to this and say that if we turn away from God enough that it can harden our heart. Um, if we ignore the call to, to live a faithful Christian life, we risk hardening our heart by losing faith, becoming complacent, and neglecting to consider God's word, essentially drifting away as Andy spoke about this morning. If we do that, we could be living for ourselves as opposed to living for God. And if we kick against the goads enough, we risk hurting ourselves just like the opposite kicks too much. Now, I wouldn't compare myself to Saul. Saul was a man who dedicated a portion of his life to tracking down Christians, putting them into prisons, consenting to their deaths, uh, and on occasion trying to get them to blaspheme and to uh, believe against the Lord Jesus Christ. But I also can't compare myself to Paul. It's the same man who dedicated a larger portion of his life uh, to faithfully preaching God's words to the Gentiles. He, he traveled possibly thousands of miles on, on uh, missionary journeys. He suffered persecution from the Pharisees. That was his own people uh, and in, for doing just that. And he was in prison for it and possibly died for that same cause. But even though I can't, consider my, I can't compare myself to Saul or in his later life Paul, that doesn't mean that I can't be guilty of kicking against the goads. I could neglect to attend worship services. I could stop reading my Bible. I could forget to pray. Anything that's basically against the will of God. And I think that it's possible that we all could be found guilty of kicking. But if Jesus could look at a man who almost single-handedly wanted to end the spread of Christianity, which Jesus Christ himself died for, if, if he could convince him to turn around and spend the remainder of his life working for the Lord instead of against him, then I know that he could look at each of us uh, and maybe help us to see when we might be falling short and help us to turn around ourselves to do His will. If you're here tonight and maybe you feel like you're kicking against the goats, maybe you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but you haven't public, publicly confessed that and, and been baptized for that. If you've not been buried with Him in His death and raised as a, cre a new creature of life, a creature, a new, with newness of life, as, as Romans 6 verse 4 says, if you've not done that, just like Andy said this morning in his his great invitation, why not? There's no better time than right now. We're never promised of tomorrow. If you if you have that belief in you, then you need to be baptized. But if you are uh, if you are a Christian and you feel like maybe you're kicking against the goads in a different way, that maybe you have been drifting away, maybe you've been falling away, you, you've, you've missed services uh, in times that you could have been here, or you've, you've neglected to study. If there's anything like that, if you've um, sinned in a public nature and you request the prayers of the church, we're here to pray with you and for you. And if we can respond to any need, if you would come forward as we stand as we sing this song.
not had the opportunity to pay the Lord's Supper, the table has been left prepared. Uh, if you'll come forward to the pew on my right as we sing the first and second verses in number 328, you'll be served. That's the first and second verses of 328. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings of this life, for the material and physical blessings that you've given us. Most of all, Father, we give thanks at this time for the spiritual blessings that you've poured upon us for thy Son and his great love for us and his willingness to be the ultimate sacrifice so that we may have hope of eternal life. Now, Father, as these partake of this unleavened bread, which is to us as Christians, represents Christ's body, we pray that they do so in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, in like manner, we're thankful for the blood of Christ and its atoning power that it has to wash away our sins. Father, as these partake of this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents that blood, we pray that they do so in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with so many material blessings and the opportunity to work in this great nation and provide for ourselves and our families. Father, as these give back, help them to purpose in their hearts and do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. And we pray that the money collected will be used to expand thy kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're using your books, it's the final song will be number 761. You can turn to that while we have a few announcements to go over uh, before we're dismissed. Uh, we mentioned this morning that Linda Cook uh, will undergo knee replacement surgery, but I think we mentioned this morning it would be Friday. Barry told me that it's, it, or we mentioned it was Thursday. Barry told me that it will actually be on Friday um, of this week. Judy Spivey is now in Kindred Nursing Facility. Uh, we had a note. Uh, Barry Cahoon's father is in St. Thomas West uh, with an infection and heart attack. But we also had an update that he is doing better and that a cath is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, prayers are also requested for Jeff Farr, cousin of Cheryl Hicks. Uh, Jeff will undergo knee replacement surgery at UT Hospital in Knoxville at 1 o'clock on June 22nd. As has been mentioned a couple of times, we do extend our sympathy to Barbara and Edward and all the family on the passing of Miss Dixon. And I believe I saw Edward bring in uh, the arrangement that sits that is sitting in front of the table, and we appreciate uh, them sharing that with us. Uh, but we are all sad tonight the passing of Miss Dixon, and the entire family will be in our prayers in the coming days, especially Miss Barbara. Uh, on the opposite note, uh, we are excited that Justin and Sarah do have, do have a new baby boy, Jacob Powell, uh, born on June 7th, uh, 7 pounds, 10 ounces, 20 and a half inches long, and they are at home, um, and we are excited with the entire family that, um, that all is well, and, and they are at home uh, enjoying being there as a family. Uh, a couple other announcements that are important in the coming week. We have our, the elders, deacons, preachers meeting on June on Wednesday after services. There are agendas on the table in the foyer for those uh, to whom it pertains to. And I also have a flyer here. Uh, Zion Church of Christ has their vacation Bible school coming up this week, um, today through Thursday. Uh, and this flyer has uh, more details on it, the topics of the night, and the speakers for each night. And I'll make sure this gets out to the uh, foyer and on the bulletin board so you can look at that uh, if you would like to um, see the details and uh, try to attend. And it, we, it does appear that Edward is speaking on Thursday night uh, of that VBS at Zion, if you want to make special note for that. On a similar note with VBS, I would like to extend a thank you to everyone who was involved in our VBS last week. Uh, there were a lot of people involved, and I cannot even begin to name who all helped, uh, but we could not have done it without each and every one who helped out uh, throughout the week and had a great VBS for all of our children. So once again, thank you for all of, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and, and Justin and Michael and, and those of us who coordinate uh, VBS each year. We appreciate all the help that we got uh, this year. Uh, are there any other announcements that I need to include? If not, if you'll stand, we'll sing the closing song and have a closing prayer to be dismissed. <laughs>
exactly. Heavenly Father, we come to you giving thanks for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come and study and worship you this morning and again this evening. Thankful for the country in which we live that we can't assemble without fear. We're thankful for the many things that we do take for granted of food, clothing, shelter, family, and friends. We pray, Heavenly Father, that everything said and done has been done in accordance to your will in this worship service. We pray now that you will be with those that mentioned that are fixing to have their surgeries and those that are recovering from surgery. And we pray that you be with, with our father and Edward as they're recovering from the loss of the sticks and that pray that they'll kind of pray on the, the good times instead of the sad times. We thank the time to have. We pray in and follow that you'll keep a safe hand over us and watch over us and bring us back at the next point of time when we realize that we are weak and sinful creatures and pray that you'll forgive us for these things. We pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 